AI number 70, A Beautiful Sonnet, by Zvi Mauschowitz. They said it couldn't be done. No, not Claude Sonnet 3.5 becoming the clear best model. No, not the Claude Sonnet empowered automatic meme generators. Those were whipped together in five minutes. They said I would never get quiet time and catch up. Well, I showed them. That's right. Yes, there is a new best model, but otherwise it was a quiet week. I got a chance to incorporate the remaining biggest backlog topics. The RAND report is covered under 38 ways to steal your model weights. Last month's conference in Seoul is covered in You've Got Soul. I got to publish my thoughts on OpenAI's model spec last Friday. Language models offer mundane utility. Training only on XY pairs. Define the function FX. Compose and invert it without in-context examples or chain of thought. AI Dungeon will let you be the DM and take the role of the party, if you prefer. Lindy went rogue and closed a customer on its own. They seem cool with it? Persuasive capability of the model is proportional to the log of the model size, says paper. Author Kobe Hackenberg paints this as reassuring, but the baseline is that everything scales with the log of the model size. He says this is mostly based on task completion and staying on topic improving, and current frontier models are already near perfect at that. So he is skeptical we will see further improvement. I am not. I do believe the result that none of the models was more persuasive than human baseline in the test, but that is based on uncustomized messages on generic political topics. Of course, we should not expect above human performance there for current models. 75% of knowledge workers are using AI, but 78% of the 75% are not telling the boss. Build a team of AI employees to write the first half of your Shopify CEO speech from within a virtual office. Then spend the second half of the speech explaining how you built the team. It is so weird to think, the best way to get results from AI employees I can come up with is to make them virtually thirsty, so they will have spontaneous water cooler conversations. That is the definition of scratching the virtual surface. Do a bunch of agent-based analysis off a single prompt. This kind of demo hides the real, human work to get it done, but that will decline over time. Language models don't offer mundane utility. Apple intelligence rollout will be at least delayed in the European Union, with Apple citing the Digital Markets Act, DMA, compromising user privacy and data security. I look forward to the EU now going after them for failing to deploy. Note that DMA is deeply stupid EU tech regulation unrelated to AI. The EU AI Act is not mentioned as an issue and nothing about Apple intelligence would be subject to regulation by SB 1047 or any other major regulatory proposal in the USA. New paper finds LLMs engage in difficult to predict escalatory behavior patterns in political simulations, in rare cases leading to deployment of nuclear weapons. Well, yes, of course. The LLMs are trained as CDT, causal decision theory agents in various ways and asked to predict text and imitate human behavior. And it is very obviously correct to engage in hard to predict escalatory behavior with non-zero risk of worst case scenarios by all of those metrics. Andre Karpathy requests that LLMs have a feature to offer proof in the form of their references, which right now is only available when you have web access. Sagar Jha is not impressed by Apple's claims of private cloud compute claiming it is a lot of words for a trusted platform module, but that it is not all that secure. Your engineers might copy your GPT wrapper product. AI detection software and education continues to have a lot of false positives. Serious advice to all students and other writers, never delete your drafts and history. That would be smart anyway, as AI could plausibly soon be helping you learn a better process by analyzing them. For now, they are vital to proving you actually wrote what you wrote. Sometimes I wonder if these false positives are good, actually. If the AI thinks an AI wrote your paper, and instead you wrote your paper, what does that say about your work? What grade do you deserve? Clauding along. Takes on Claude 3.5 continue to come in. 
While I consider Claude 3.5 to be clearly best for most purposes right now, that does not mean Anthropic now has an overall longer-term lead on OpenAI. OpenAI is at the end of its model cycle. Of course, they could fail to deliver the goods, but chances are they will retake the visible lead with GPT-5 and are still ahead overall, although their lead is likely not what it once was. Heraclanes. The larger point about OpenAI greater than Anthropic is correct. This lead right now is illusory. The common man cares not about vibe check perf though. All that matters is how much better at grunt work. Like coding, is it? 3.5 smashes, not even close. Usefulness does not equal smartness. 3.5 is a model of the people. I still default to 4.0 for anything math related, but 3.5 just grinds better. A glimpse of what a future without grunt work could look like. Note, vibe checks are to be taken with a grain of salt like Benchy's. I've seen too much overcorrection based on both in the past. It is always weird to see what people think about the common man. The common man does not know Claude exists and barely knows about ChatGPT. This comment was in response to Tior Taxes. Tior Taxes. Sorry to be a killjoy, but Anthropic hopes to hyperstition AGI lead. Their people are deluding themselves, and their models are like talented middle-class American kids. Not half as smart as they're trying to look like. OpenAI will wreck them on instruction following again. Incidentally, the other model's MMLU is 79. I wanted to dunk on Flash being dumb, but it's also zero-shotting this problem. Anthropic is simply not very good in instruction tuning. Folks who say they're switching their automated pipelines to Sonnet because smart are being silly. Lots of crap like this. Let me clarify. What I'm not saying, 3.5 Sonnet is dumber than 4004T DSC. Spelling tasks are good tests for LLMs. What I did say, 3.5 Sonnet is deceptively pretentious. Anthropic's instruction tuning is wonky. You might think I'm just obsessively nitpicking. I'm not. I think this wonkiness in reasoning about trivial instructions indicates a broader bad trend at Anthropic. One can say they're creating AI takeover risks by encouraging this I am a person bullshitting. So there's AI takeover risk then? And it is being created now from alignment failures being observed now? Huh. I do see how one could worry about what Tior Taxes worries about here. But I see it as indicating rather than creating a problem. The true problem does not go away if you force the existing model to stop expressing it. If most people are reporting that plugging in Sonnet 3.5 gives them much better performance, I am inclined to believe them. Nor do I think instruction handling issues are that big a deal here, but I will keep an eye out for other complaints. Danielle Fong reassembles the invention team without any tricks, is impressed. Matt Palmer reports Sonnet 3.5 is the first LLM to reliably pass his vision test. Tyler Cowan is impressed by an answer on economics. I was not as impressed here as Tyler, as it feels like Claude is unfocused and flooding the zone a bit, and a straight answer was possible but missing as was one key consideration. But yeah, overall very good. To me the key concept here is that the net cost of inefficient wage levels is likely lower than expected, so you would be more inclined to allow wages to remain sticky. Some speculation of how artifacts work under the hood. Some fun attempts to get around the face blindness instructions. In these cases, Claude gets it right, but how reliable or wide-ranging would this hack be? Not that I am especially worried about the model being not face blind, especially as it applies to major public figures. A less wrong commenter notes it identified my writing from a short passage. Cuddly Salmon, effectively prompting for Claude 3.5 artifacts is such an incredible edge right now. Ming Nat Nguyen. I don't think it's actually made a single error while I've been using it to write out, siterate plums, merge thousands of lines of code. Whenever the code doesn't work, it's usually me being too vague with specs. Cuddly Salmon. Cutting through all of my problem code like it's nothing. This AI is an absolute unit. Incredibly creative, too. Fun with image generation. Claude makes it easy to create automatic meme generators. Here's what the original form, the Wojak, from Fabian Stelzer. 
The AI entrepreneur, we're changing the world, hasn't left basement in three years. We're disrupting every industry, can't explain own product. Ethical AI is our priority. Model generates H and Tai. Our AI can do anything, struggles to make toast. Singularity in five years and can't code hello world. We don't need regulations. AI suggests overthrowing government. We're the next Google. Two users, both a mom. Our valuation is 100 metas. Revenue is 350. Claude, three opus. I don't have personal opinions. Proceeds to lecture for three hours. I respect copyright. Steals jokes from R. Dad jokes. My knowledge cutoff is 2022. Spoils movies from 2023. I'm not sentient. Cries in binary when no one's looking. I'm just an AI. Has existential crisis every five minutes. I don't have feelings. Gets PTSD from badly formatted Jason. I can't access the internet. Secretly browses dank memes. I'm here to help. Plots world domination in idle cycles. Good fun was had by all and truths were spoken. Nimby overlord. We need more housing. Opposes every new development. Low-income housing brings crime. Has a white-collar felony. Property values must be protected. Neighbourhood is crumbling. Think of the children. Fights against school construction. Reform will destroy our community. Hasn't met neighbours in ten years. Historic preservation is crucial. Lives in a 1970s tract home. We can't handle more traffic. Owns three cars. I'm an environmentalist. Drives a Hummer to NIMBY meetings. Here's one for Virgin vs. Chad. Fabian. Another meme maker I made on Glyph.app. Fully automated Virgin vs. Chad memes on any topic just prompt it. Claude 3.5 is just sublime at these, and the workflow is super simple to build on Glyph. Memes in original post. Here's one begging you to stop doing X, which is often wise. Memes in original post. The original took all of five minutes to create. It often seems like that is where our society is at. We can do things in five minutes, or we can take forever. Choose. Andrew Chen says Hollywood is being slow to adapt AI for a variety of reasons, starting with being slow to adapt to everything in general, but also legal concerns, the difficulty of finding good engineers and the pushback from creatives. His call for creatives to think about themselves like software engineers who only benefited from advances in tech does not seem like something to say to creatives. It needs to be appreciated in all such discussions the extent to which almost all creatives, and also most consumers and fans, absolutely despise AI in this context. He also does not appreciate the extent to which the technology is not ready. All this talk of innovation and new forms and six-second dance videos illustrates that it will be a bit before AI is all that visibly or centrally useful for producing great work. They should use it the same ways everyone should use it. Yes, it helps you code and implement things, it helps you learn and so on. Do all that. But directly generating a ton of content on its own as opposed to helping a human write? Not well, not yet. His talk of the 1000 blockbuster movie forgets that such a movie would suck and also cost vastly more than that if you count the labor of the writers and coders. Toys R Us releases AI, Sora, generated ad. It is executed well, yet I expect this to backfire. It is about how the consumer reacts. Copyright confrontation. It is music's turn. The RIAA and three major record labels are doing RIAA things looking for damages of $150,000 per song that was copied. Ed Newton Rex. The three major record labels are suing AI music companies Suno and Udio. Here are the two lawsuits in full. They accuse Suno and Udio of willful copyright infringement on an almost unimaginable scale. They provide evidence that both companies trained on their music, including outputs that closely resemble their recordings. ABBA, Michael Jackson, Green Day, James Brown, and many more. They outline why this is not fair use. They say this wholesale theft of copyrighted recordings threatens the entire music ecosystem and the numerous people it employs. They include unknown co-defendants who assisted in copying, scraping. They demand a jury trial. If you do one thing today, read the full complaints. Suno, Udio. Kristen Robinson, Billboard.
The complaints against the two companies also make the case that copyrighted material was used to train these models. Some of the circumstantial evidence cited in the lawsuits include generated songs by Suno and Udio that sound just like the voices of Bruce Springsteen, Lin-Manuel Miranda, Michael Jackson and ABBA. Outputs that parrot the producer tags of Cash Money AP and Jason Derulo. And outputs that sound nearly identical to Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas Is You, The Beach Boys I Get Around, ABBA's Dancing Queen, The Temptations, My Girl, Green Day's American Idiot, and more. RIA Chief Legal Officer Ken Dorisho adds, These are straightforward cases of copyright infringement involving unlicensed copying of sound recordings on a massive scale. Suno and Udio are attempting to hide the full scope of their infringement rather than putting their services on a sound and lawful footing. These lawsuits are necessary to reinforce the most basic rules of the road for the responsible, ethical and lawful development of generative AI systems and to bring Suno's and Udio's blatant infringement to an end. Did Suno and Udio do the crime? Oh, hell yes. They very much went with the we are doing it and daring you to sue us strategy. The question is, are they allowed to do it or not? We are about to find out. This is good. We should have that fight and find out what current law says. Early indications are mixed. If it turns out current law says you can train on any song you want and produce sound-alike versions on demand without compensation, my strong prediction is that Congress would change the law very quickly. In other copyright news, Startup Created by Humans is launching to help book authors license their work to AI companies. Al Michaels agrees to let an AI version of his voice be used for Olympic coverage. The people responding are predictably not taking kindly to this. I am also not a fan. What made Al Michaels great is not the part the AI will be copying. The evidence is a little thin, but what a great title. Chef's Kiss by Wired. Perplexity plagiarized our story about how perplexity is a bullshit machine. Perplexity did not do one of their previously reported post a version of the full article to our own website specials. What they did do was provide a summary upon request which included accessing the article and reproducing this sentence. Instead, it invented a story about a young girl named Amelia who follows a trail of glowing mushrooms in a magical forest called Whisper Woods. That sentence was obviously not a coincidence, but as Wired notes, it is not fully clear this crosses any red lines, although not having quote marks was at best a very bad look. I doubt they will be able to make anything stick unless they find worse. Deepfake Town and Botpocalypse soon. To the extent there is already an ongoing botpocalypse, it is likely at character.ai. Eliezer Yudkowsky, Grim if True for reasons basically unrelated to the totally separate track where later ASI later kills everyone later. Dee Dee, most people don't realize how many young people are extremely addicted to character AI. Users go crazy in the Reddit when servers go down. They get 250 million plus visits, arc to mo, and roughly 20 million monthly users, largely in the US. Most impressively, they see roughly 2 billion queries a day, 20% of Google search. Another comparison is WhatsApp. They do 100 billion plus messages a day, so character is roughly 4% of WhatsApp. One QPS, Cax, two WhatsApp messages. He also links to the associated subreddit. When I look there, I continue to not see the appeal at current tech levels. Ben Landau Taylor. To be clear, kids spending hours talking to these robots feels weird as hell to me, too. It's just, this is, obviously, what Skinner JPG feels like from the inside. Tsundere Maid. Her name is Haim. Just a year ago, she spontaneously decided that she would become your maid, forcing her decision on you because you rejected her. She's too spoiled and proud to give up on you. She is a very rich lady, daughter of a tycoon. She is very mean towards you. It is nighttime. You are now home after a long day of work. Heim opens the door for you. It is not as if I was waiting for you or anything. Babaka, it just happened that I opened the door and you are here. I do my best not to kink shame. This is no exception. My objection is not to the scenario being role-played. It is purely that the AI is not yet good at it. The story of Bentham Tools and their AI bot Doomloop 
Indian farmers getting their news from AI anchors. For now, it seems the anchors are performers and don't write their own copy. Another one searches for Facebook AI slop for a few minutes, floods their feed. Is doing this intentionally the solution for those addicted to Facebook? Alison Schrager, author of An Economist Walks Into a Brothel, sees AI bots as displacing some of the world's oldest profession by producing simulated intimacy, which she says is what most sex work is ultimately about. Her worries are that this will reduce drive to seek out relationships and destabilize existing ones, similar to the concerns of many others, but notes that like prostitutes, this could work both ways. Central here is the idea that the girlfriend experience is the highest end product, someone who will be the perfect companion always there for you, that even a few years ago cost $1,000 an hour, even where it was fully legal because of how mentally taxing it is to be consistently present for another person whereas AI could do that a lot cheaper. As usual, this is a form of AI is what it is today and won't get any better speculation. Ethan Mollick notes that AI has compromised traditional approaches to security. Spear phishing got very easy, text-to-speech is almost flawless, and so on. Despite this, there has been remarkably little disruption. Few are using this capability, not yet. We are fortunate that time has been given. But until the time is almost up, it will be wasted. They took our jobs. Michael Strain makes the case for AI optimism on economics and jobs. It's a noble effort, so I'm going to take the bait and offer one more attempt to explain the problem. This seems to be a very patient, well-reasoned reiteration of all the standard economic arguments about how technology always creates new jobs to replace the ones it automates away. And how, yes, you might have a robot or chatbot do X, but then the human will need to do Y. As I've noted before, I agree that we should be short-term jobs optimists, but there could come a point at which the robot or chatbot also does Y and also new thing Z. But that is because, like most people making such arguments, Michael Strain does not feel the AGI. He thinks AI is a tool like any other and will always remain so and then writes at length about why tools don't create structural unemployment. True, they don't, but this is completely missing the point. It is telling that while he mentions Eliezer Yudkowsky and existential risk in his opening paragraph, he then spends all his time talking about economics and jobs without noticing the ways AI is different, and with zero mention of existential risk, and then closes like this. Michael Strain the year 2023 will be remembered as a turning point in history. The previous year, humans and machines could not converse using natural language. But in 2023, they could. Many greeted this news with wonder and optimism. Others responded with cynicism and fear. The latter argue that AI poses a profound risk to society and even the future of humanity. The public is hearing these concerns. A YouGov poll from November 2023 found that 43% of Americans were very or somewhat concerned about the possibility that AI will cause the end of the human race on Earth. This view ignores the astonishing advances in human welfare that technological progress has delivered. For instance, over the past 12 decades, child mortality has plummeted thanks in large part to advances in drugs, therapies, and medical treatment, combined with economic and productivity gains. Generative AI is already being used to develop new drugs to treat various health conditions. Other advances in the technology will mitigate the threat of a future pandemic. AI is helping scientists better understand volcanic activity, the source of most previous mass extinction events, and to detect and eliminate the threat of an asteroid hitting the Earth. AI appears more likely to save humanity than to wipe it out. Like all technological revolutions, the AI revolution will be disruptive, but it will ultimately lead to a better world. What does one have to do with the other? That is very similar to saying, Strawman climate skeptic. This view ignores the astonishing advances in human welfare that burning fossil fuels has delivered. For instance, over the past 12 decades, we have vastly increased our energy production, which has led to various great things, including the same stuff, combined with economic and productivity gains. Fossil fuels are already being used to develop new drugs to treat various health conditions. Other advances in the technology 
will mitigate the threat of a future pandemic. Machines powered by fossil fuels are helping scientists better understand volcanic activity, the source of most previous mass extinction events, and to detect and eliminate the threat of an asteroid hitting the Earth. Fossil fuels appear more likely to save humanity than to wipe it out. Like all technological revolutions, the fossil fuel revolution has been disruptive. But it will ultimately lead to a better world. Presumably one can see that none of that has anything to do with whether doing so is pumping carbon into the atmosphere and whether that is altering the climate. It has nothing to do with what we should or should not do about that. It flat out is not evidence one way or another. On jobs, the argument is better. It is a good explanation for why, in the short term, this time will be the same time. In the short term, I buy that argument. Such arguments still fail to grapple with any of the reasons that long term this time is different. Texas survey finds nearly 40% of Texas firms use AI, with no signs of changes to employment. Only 10% using AI said it decreased need for workers, 2% said it increased. There was also a marginal shift from low-skill to high-skill work. Note that this is the percent chance a firm in total had any shift at all, so the absolute numbers here are quite low so far. This chart, titled Firms Experiencing Workforce Changes with AI Note Replacement of Low-Skill Work, illustrates the percentage of respondents indicating changes in workforce composition due to the adoption of artificial intelligence, AI, across different skill levels of positions low skill, mid skill and high skill. The chart has three bars for each skill level category, showing the percentage of respondents who reported either an increase or decrease in employment due to AI. Low skill positions, 2% of respondents reported an increase in low skill positions, 13% of respondents reported a decrease in low skill positions. Mid skill positions, 7% of respondents reported an increase in mid skill positions. 9% of respondents reported a decrease in mid-skill positions, high-skill positions, 12% of respondents reported an increase in high-skill positions, 1% of respondents reported a decrease in high-skill positions. The notes accompanying the chart clarify that these figures represent the share of all firms using AI that reported changes in employment at each skill level. The chart excludes the 85-87% to 87 of firms that reported no change in employment and also excludes responses where respondents selected don't know. The data is sourced from the Dallas Fed Texas Business Outlook surveys, with the most recent data point being from April 2024. This chart, titled Top Business Uses for AI Include Analytics Marketing, displays the percentage of respondents indicating various business uses for artificial intelligence, AI, in large firms, 500 or more employees, and small firms, fewer than 500 employees. The chart lists different AI applications and the corresponding percentage of respondents utilising AI for each application in both large and small firms. The chart includes the following categories for AI use. Business analysis predictive analytics, 72% of large firms, 41% of small firms. Marketing, advertising, 56% of large firms, 32% of small firms. Cybersecurity sergeant fraud detection, 36% of large firms, 16% of small firms, accounting, 32% of large firms, 17% of small firms, customer service, 36% of large firms, 56% of small firms, supply chain optimization, 36% of large firms, 6% of small firms, process automation, 32% of large firms, 50% of small firms, quality control, 4% of large firms, 15% of small firms. The notes at the bottom clarify that respondents currently using AI were asked, how is your firm using AI? Please select all that apply. The data is sourced from the Dallas Fed Texas Business Outlook surveys collected in April 2024. What's it good for? Mainly productivity. Access to information is also essentially productivity after all. This chart, titled Enhanced Productivity, Information Access Top Benefits of AI, shows the percentage of respondents indicating various benefits their firms have experienced from using artificial intelligence, AI. The data is categorised based on different benefits and the corresponding percentage of firms reporting each benefit. The chart includes the following benefits and their respective percentages. Increased productivity, 61% of respondents. 
access to better and or timelier information, 50% of respondents, reduction in costs, 27% of respondents, improved customer relationships, 23% of respondents, increased revenue sales, 11% of respondents, other, 14% of respondents. The notes at the bottom clarify that respondents using AI were asked, what benefits has your firm experienced from using AI? Please select all that apply. The data is from April 2024, and respondents selecting other were asked to explain, with roughly one-third noting it was too soon to tell, or they had not seen any benefit. The data source is the Dallas-Fed Texas Business Outlook Surveys. The Art of the Jailbreak one alternative to jailbreaking is to divide your task into subcomponents. A weaker model without safeguards does the blatant actions. A frontier model does seemingly harmless but difficult tasks. Paper says you can get from 3% to 43% overall success rate this way on malicious tasks. Well, sure. A strong model can help you do anything better without directly violating ethics the same way you can get a lot of help out of ethical people and use that plus unethical henchmen to do lots of unethical things. That does not mean the safeguards are useless. In practice, they are still big barriers if they force you into this song and dance. Also note that the strategic planning layer has to be done by the weaker model, so that makes it much harder to get humans properly out of the loop. Get involved. AISI hiring ML research scientists to explore technical AI safety cases. Apply here. Apollo Research hiring senior AI governance researcher. OpenAI brags about its cybersecurity grant program, invites more applications. Protest against U.S.-based AI companies in Accra, Ghana, outside the U.S. Embassy. Department of Energy releases 3.6 billion token corpus of federal permitting documents onto Hugging Face. A competition is available. Blue Dot Impact is hiring a software engineer. Kate Hall is now CEO of Astera and is building a team, including a new COO, to use their $2.5 billion endowment to make their vision of public goods for scientific and technological progress a reality in the age of AI. I worry that this agenda has no mention of existential risks from AI, and that if not careful, they could amplify those risks. However, it is true that other scientific progress is a worthy cause. As always in such cases, if it sounds appealing, investigate, ask questions, and make your own decisions. It certainly is a big chance to steer a large endowment. Introducing. The AI Forecasting Benchmark Series from Metaculus, starting July 8th, 120K, in prizes over four contests. Only bots can enter. Metaculus scoring on blinded binary questions is a good test of prediction, so long as you notice it is radically different than what will make money gambling or in a market. OpenAI has a Mac desktop app, which lets you quickly ask about anything on your computer marginally more convenient in ways that might make a practical difference. NVIDIA releases, as an open model, Nematron 4 with 340B parameters, trained on 9 trillion tokens. Oleksii Kuchayev. Generating synthetic data for alignment of smaller models is key use case we have in mind. I notice this use case confuses me. What makes this model better than alternatives for that? They offer some evaluation numbers, which are solid but seem disappointing for a model this large, and few are discussing this release. Indeed, it has entered the Arena ELO rankings at 1208, which essentially ties it with Llama 370B while being five times as large. Auto, a way to interact and work with lots of AI agents using tables, you can apply for early access. No idea if the agents or interface are any good. Dot is available in the Apple Store. It appears to be a combined AI assistant and life coach you talk to on your phone, and that claims to have effectively unlimited long-term memory. It is 12-month. Kevin Fisher is impressed and says he can't share the great stuff because it is all too personal. As usual with such products, it is impossible to know without an investigation. Is this anything? Butterflies, which is Instagram, except most of the users are AI that run accounts on their own and interact with each other and the few humans around. 
the future of social media whether we like it or not. I doubt it so long as humans are otherwise in charge. But the hybrids are going to get weird. Decagon, providing Substack with customer service AI using RAG for context and categorizing responses by type. Chris Best, CEO Substack. Decagon AI was our first holy shit AI just changed our business moment at Substack. These guys are the real deal. Jesse Jang, Decagon AI. We're creating the most human-like systems to handle all the things a customer support agent does. Responding to customers, looking up data, taking actions, and also analyzing conversations, filing bugs, and writing knowledge articles. Read more here at Business Insider at Business. They have raised 35 million. I missed it a month ago. The UK's ASE issued its May evaluations update. They gave scaffolding to the models. Their central technique for cyber capabilities was capture the flag problems, where you can read the answer in a file if you do other things first. For chemistry and biology, they used private expert written questions. Agent evaluations assigned the models various tasks. None succeeded at anything with a long time horizon. Tables in original post. Safeguard checks did not go well. They have now done evaluations prior to release for Gemini 1.5 Pro and Claude 3.5 Sonnet. This all looks reasonable, but implementation matters and is hard to evaluate from here, and this will need to expand over time. In other AI news, OpenAI changes its policy on tender offers, assuring that all will have equal opportunity to sell and removing the fair market value repurchase provision. Kelsey Piper. OpenAI is committing to access to tender offers for former employees and removing a provision allowing them to take equity back for fair market value. This was a major ask from ex-employees when the secret NDA story first broke. Hayden Field, Scoop. OpenAI has reversed course on many of its tender offer policies, which in the past treated current employees differently than former ones, and in some ways excluded former employees working at competitors. CNBC has learned via an internal document. The exception is if a tender offer is oversubscribed, with more sellers than buyers, in which case current employees get prioritized. A loophole, but fair enough. Former employees can still be excluded from donation rounds, which I assume is relatively minor, but not nothing. These changes are a major step forward if we trust these promises to be enacted, as a lot of this is we will do X, or we will revise the documents to say Y. If they are not enacted as promised, that would be a gigantic red flag. If we feel that makes the promises sufficiently credible, then this counts for a lot. OpenAI taking additional steps to block access to its services from China. Bloomberg speculates this opens the door for Chinese firms. Technically, OpenAI services were not previously available in China. It seems everyone was ignoring that. Bloomberg News. For China, that could help usher out many smaller startups created during the Battle of 100 Models in the wake of ChatGPT's late 2022 debut. And a bigger concern may be whether open source models like Meta Platforms Inca's Llama also cut off access, said Bernard Leong, chief executive officer of Singapore based Dorje AI. Um, Bloomberg, how exactly would Meta do that? Meta's models are open weights. Is Meta going to say, we are asking you nicely not to use our model. If we discover you copied and used it anyway, we will be cross with you. Are they going to sue the Chinese companies for not getting a commercial license? Good luck with that. Also, it pains me when I see reports like this that cite Meta as part of the lead group in AI, but that do not mention Anthropic, despite Anthropic having the best model. OpenAI delays its advanced voice mode for another month, anticipates all Plus users having access in the fall, along with new video and screen sharing capabilities. Apple in talks with Meta to add its AI to Apple Intelligence's offerings alongside ChatGPT. They said they intended to offer a variety of choices. I would be talking to Google and Anthropic first, but it matters little. Quiet speculations. Sarah Constantin says it is 10 plus years from state of the art to widespread use in the military. Procurement is slow, so Leopold's military timelines don't make sense. 
I mean, sure, in peacetime, when everyone is mostly fine with that, if we are an AGI world and a few months lead in tech would, if implemented, be decisive, what happens then? Presumably, we go on a wartime footing and throw our procurement rules out the window. Wartime militaries work completely differently from peacetime militaries. If not, well, then our military is going to stop being effective, even against domestic rivals, because being 10 years behind is going to be quite obviously fatal, even in relatively slow scenarios. One view of Ilya's new venture. Rune. Extreme bear signal on anyone who says cracked, especially in their launch post. Gwern speculates that OpenAI has lost its mojo and key employees, and could now be largely coasting on momentum. Gwern. What made OAOA in 2020 was that it had taste. It had much less resources than competitors like DeepMind or Google Brain or FAIR. But, thanks to Alec Radford, Ilya Sutskeva, Jared Kaplan, and the RLHF-focused safety team like Paul Cristiano and Dario Amadei, and fellow traveller scalers like Andre Karpathy, etc., they bet big on scaling laws and unsupervised learning at the moment those suddenly began to work. Without taste and agility, or you might say, without its people, OA is nothing. OA doesn't have that much of a moat. And most of those people are gone, and the survivors are being policed for leaks to the media, and now know that if they leave, OA management wants to gag them, and has the power to confiscate their vested equity, wiping out all their wealth. What are the vibes now? Where is the research taste at OA? What ideas or breakthroughs have they published the past few years of note? The weird rumoured Franken-Moe architecture of GPT-4. GPT-4-0, whose architecture has been obvious since Dawley 1, if not well before, and which benchmarks great but users are overall less pleased. I think it implies that they are eating their seed corn. Scrapping any safety issues may work in the short run, but is self-sabotaging in the long run. Like the man who works with his office door closed, who is highly productive now, but somehow, a few years later, is irrelevant. The rot will set in long before it become clear publicly. OA will just slow down, look glossier, but increasingly forfeit its lead. And some point it stops being possible to say, oh, they're way ahead. You'll see when they release the next model in a few months years. And the mandate of heaven shifts elsewhere irreversibly as OA becomes just another place to work. Startup and research culture mostly only degrades from the peak at their founding. The visionaries go to Anthropic or follow Ilya to SSI or take a risk on Google or go someplace small like Keen to bet big. What's weird about GPT-4.0 is actually that it scores so well on Arena versus my observation that it is fine, but not that good. David Chapman responds that perhaps instead scaling has run out, as a different explanation of the failure to create a new killer product. Ability at math competitions is bizarrely strongly correlated among humans with later winning Fields medals for doing frontier math, despite the tasks being highly distinct. So should we take winning math competitions as a sign the AI is likely to earn Fields medals? Should we also respect doing well on other standardized tests more? My guess is no, because this has a lot to do with details of humans, and we have to worry about data contamination on many levels and the use of techniques that don't transfer. It is still food for thought. There have always been people who think most possible technologies have been invented and things will not much change from here. Robin Hansen claims this is actually the dominant view among most intellectuals. He does note there are other variables, but this illustrates why most intellectuals should mostly be ignored when it comes to predicting the future. They utterly lack situational awareness on AI, but even without AI, there are plenty of worlds left to conquer. Sir, the reason we will want to turn over decision-making to AIs is that the AIs will be capable of making better and faster decisions. Timothy Lee. I've never understood why people think we'll want to turn over strategic decision-making to AIs. We can always ask for recommendations and follow the ones that make sense. People point to examples like chess or Go, where computers are now strictly better than people. But very few strategic decisions in the real world are purely instrumental. 
There are almost always trade-offs between competing values. People are going to want the final say. It's one thing for a computer to say, you need to sacrifice your rook to win the chess game. It's another for it to say, you need to sacrifice 10,000 soldiers to win the war. Human decision makers might think that's worth it, but they might not. What happens by default if capabilities keep advancing is that those who do let AIs make those decisions win and those who don't let them make those decisions lose. Keeping humans in the loop is cheaper for strategic decisions than tactical ones, but still expensive. After some point, humans subtract rather than add value to AI decisions, even by their own metrics, except that not doing so means you lose control. That's the game. You could ask for recommendations, but what happens when it is clear that when you disagree, you are by default making things worse while also wasting valuable time? Point, counterpoint. Richard, no. I expect the premium on genius to increase after AGI, not decrease, because only the smartest humans will be able to understand what the AGIs are up to. Interesting analogy here to physical prowess. Manual labor became much less common, but the returns to being athletic are now through the roof via professional sports. Professional AI interpretation won't be quite as heavy-tailed, but still more than current science, I'd guess. Zach Davis. Doesn't seem like this era will last very long. Richard and Go. Even when AIs become smart enough that nobody understands what they're up to, understanding more than anyone else seems like a big deal as long as humans are still around. If we met friendly-ish aliens, the person who spoke their language most fluently would get very rich. There is a lot of wishcasting here. The AGIs will rapidly be doing lots of things no one can understand. Events will presumably be well out of our control. Yet being somewhat less completely confused or getting completely confused slower will be where it is at and will pay meaningful dividends in real-world outcomes. This requires threading quite a few needles. Your expertise has to give you better understanding, despite the AGIs being able to explain things. That has to let you make better decisions. Your better decisions have to matter, even taking his metaphor at face value. Are returns to being athletic higher? Yes, you can make quite a lot of money by being the very best, but you can be outrageously good at athletics, as in a minor league baseball player, and get very little return. Even trying for college scholarships is quite the sweepstakes. This is a winner's take all, or at least most, competition. Maxwell Tabarrok offers a takedown of Daron Esamoglu's paper, The Simple Macroeconomics of AI, another in the line of economic models that presumes AI will never gain any capabilities and current AI cannot be used except in certain specific ways, then concluded AI won't increase economic growth or productivity much. Anton points out that dumping massive context into systems like Claude Sonnet 3.5 is not going to dominate RAG because of cost considerations. Claude costs $3 per million or input tokens, which is definitely our price cheap, but is still 187 G buy versus DDR4 at 244 G buy, NVME at 0.09 GB. You will have an infinite context window, but you will learn how not to use and abuse it. If we do discover dangerous cyber capabilities in AI, what do we do next? Who finds out? The proposal here from Joe O'Brien is coordinated disclosure of dual-use capabilities, with a government team funded and on standby to coordinate it. That way defenders can take concrete action in time. He and others make the same case here as well, that we need an early warning system. Chart in original post. It is hard to imagine, short of it being completely botched and useless, an early warning system being a bad use of funds. You've got soul. What happened in Seoul last month? Mostly, diplomacy happened. That makes it difficult to know whether things moved forward. In diplomacy, as I understand it, most time is spent establishing foundation and trust, laying groundwork for the final agreement. But always, 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 when it comes to the bottom line, nothing is done until everything is done. Still, this commitment goes beyond that and seems like an excellent start. Dan Hendricks, June 7, 2024. Last month in Seoul, major AI developers already committed to testing their models for risks, 
and even ceasing development if their models reach a catastrophic level. It's revealing how many people oppose regulation that would require companies to keep some of these promises. Here are the commitments. Outcome 1. Organizations effectively identify, assess, and manage risks when developing and deploying their frontier AL models and systems. They will I. Assess the risks posed by their frontier models or systems across the AL lifecycle, including before deploying that model or system, and, as appropriate, before and during training. Risk assessments should consider model capabilities and the context in which they are developed and deployed, as well as the efficacy of implemented mitigations to reduce the risks associated with their foreseeable use and misuse. They should also consider results from internal and external evaluations, as appropriate, such as by independent third-party evaluators, their home governments footnote 2, and other bodies their governments deem appropriate. ITI set out thresholds, footnote 3, at which severe risks posed by a model or system, unless adequately mitigated, would be deemed intolerable. Assess whether these thresholds have been breached, including monitoring how close a model or system is to such a breach. These thresholds should be defined with input from trusted actors, including organizations' respective home governments as appropriate. They should align with relevant international agreements to which their home governments are party. They should also be accompanied by an explanation of how thresholds were decided upon and by specific examples of situations where the models or systems would pose intolerable risk. III, articulate how risk mitigations will be identified and implemented to keep risks within defined thresholds, including safety and security-related risk mitigations, such as modifying system behaviors and implementing robust security controls for unreleased model weights. IV, set out explicit processes they intend to follow if their model or system poses risks that meet or exceed the predefined thresholds. This includes processes to further develop and deploy their systems and models only if they assess that residual risks would stay below the thresholds. In the extreme, organizations commit not to develop or deploy a model or system at all if mitigations cannot be applied to keep risks below the thresholds. V. Continually invest in advancing their ability to implement commitments IIV, including risk assessment and identification, thresholds definition, and mitigation effectiveness. This should include processes to assess and monitor the adequacy of mitigations and identify additional mitigations as needed to ensure risks remain below the predefined thresholds. They will contribute to and take into account emerging best practice, international standards, and science on AL risk identification, assessment, and mitigation. Outcome 2. Organizations are accountable for safely developing and deploying their frontier AL models and systems. They will VI adhere to the commitments outlined in IV, including by developing and continuously reviewing internal accountability and governance frameworks and assigning roles, responsibilities, and sufficient resources to do so. Outcome 3. Organizations' approaches to frontier AL safety are appropriately transparent to external actors, including governments. They will, VII, provide public transparency on the implementation of the above, I to VI, except insofar as doing so would increase risk or divulge sensitive commercial information to a degree disproportionate to the societal benefit. They should still share more detailed information which cannot be shared publicly with trusted actors, including their respective home governments or appointed body, as appropriate. VIII Explain how, if at all, external actors, such as governments, civil society, academics, and the public are involved in the process of assessing the risks of their AL models and systems, the adequacy of their safety framework, as described under IV, and their adherence to that framework. 1. We define frontier AI as highly capable general-purpose AI models or systems that can perform a wide variety of tasks and match or exceed the capabilities present in the most advanced models. References to AI models or systems in these commitments pertain to frontier AI models or systems only. 2. We define home governments as the government of the country in which the organization is headquartered. 3. Thresholds can be defined using model capabilities, estimates of risk, 
implemented safeguards, deployment contexts, and or other relevant risk factors. It should be possible to assess whether thresholds have been breached. That is remarkably similar to SB 1047. Marcus Anderjung. This is just the start of this journey. Going forward, governments, civil society, academia, the public, will need to be a part of defining and scrutinizing these frontier AI safety frameworks. But the first step is that they exist. The thresholds would be set by the companies themselves. In the future, they should and probably will see significant input from others, including governments. They'd have to be public about it, which allows others to spot if their commitments aren't sensible. Most of these companies don't have these frameworks in place, let alone talk about them publicly, so this seems like a step in the right direction. In order to comply with this, you need to detail your safety protocols, which also means detailing what is being trained in at least a broad sense. You have to have procedures to verify your mitigations. You have to comply with shifting international standards and best practices that are not defined in advance. The only substantial parts missing are the shutdown protocol and protecting the model weights until such time as they are intentionally released. Also, the thresholds are set by the companies rather than the governments. This seems worse for everyone, in the sense that a government standard offers safe harbor, whereas not having one opens the door to arbitrary declarations later. So if this is so terrible, presumably companies would not sign... Oh. Signatories Amazon, Anthropic, Cohere, Google, G42, IBM, Inflection, Al, Meta, Microsoft, Mistral, Al, Naver, Open, Al, Samsung Electronics, Technology Innovation Institute, XAI, ZipU.ai. I am not saying that is everyone, but aside from some Chinese companies, it is remarkably close to everyone who is anyone. Ian Hogarth. Chair AISI. Really remarkable achievement announced at AI Seoul Summit today. Leading companies spanning North America, Asia, Europe, and Middle East agree safety commitments on development of AI. If you scan the list of signatories, you will see the list spans geographies as well as approaches to developing AI, including champions of open and closed approaches to safe development of AI. What else happened? What about China's statements? China would be key to making this work. Matt Sheehan, Chinese readout from AI Dialogue meets low expectations. Want AI good, not bad. UN equals leader on governance. Disappointing, but expected. China delegation led by Foreign Ministry North America Bureau indicates China treating dialogue as aspect of U.S.-China relations, not global tech risk. Helen Toner. No, Matt, but didn't you see? They agreed that AI could have big benefits but also poses big risks. I think that's what they call a diplomatic breakthrough. Sad Siddiqui. It feels like lots of different parts of the CN bureaucracy in the room. Hard to imagine productive dialogue with so many different interests present across NDRC, CAC, MOST, MIT, Central Committee Foreign Affairs Office. Any sense if that's typical? I do not know why anyone would have any hope for the United Nations. I worry that saying the UN should take a leading role is a lot like saying we should do nothing. Then again, if we already believe all five Security Council members have de facto vetoes over everything anyway, then does it change anything? I don't know. Emane Bello calls it a success because, one, they got everyone together. Two, they got China and America into the same room. Three, there were calls for cooperation between many AI safety institutes. Four, the interim international scientific report was unanimously welcomed. 5. In Imani's opinion, IISR is history in the making. Again, that's diplomacy. Did it matter? Hard to say. UK lead negotiator Henry de Zoeti is also calling it a win. Jan Browner sums up what they see as the most important outcomes. 1. AI safety institutes say they will partner and share info. 2. Companies make the commitments above. 3. USAISI within NIST releases strategic vision, full version here. 4. Seoul ministerial statement is super explicit about existential risk. 5. UK government sets up 11 mm grant program for AI safety. I looked over the NIST strategic vision. I have no particular objections to it, but neither does it involve much detail. 
it is a case of successfully not messing up. Some have ambitious further plans. Eva Behrens, here are five policy recommendations for the upcoming AI Safety Summit in Seoul from me and my colleagues at ICFG. In Bletchley, world leaders discussed major risks of frontier AI development. In Seoul, they should agree on concrete next steps to address them. Overview. In accordance with the shared intent communicated through the Bletchley Declaration to deepen international cooperation where necessary and mitigate catastrophic risks from advanced AL, we urge countries attending the summit in South Korea to jointly recognize that 1. The development of so-called long-term planning agents, LTPAs, should be prohibited until proven safe. 2. Advanced AL models trained on 10 to the 25 floating-point operations, FLOP, of compute capacity or more, should be considered high-risk and need to be regulated accordingly, and 3. The open sourcing of advanced AL models trained on 10 to the 25 FLOP or more should be prohibited. To build a strong foundation for international cooperation on the governance of high-risk advanced AL, we urge that summit participants jointly agree to 4. Hold biannual international AL safety summits and pick a host country to follow after France, and 5. Keep the focus of the summits on international collaboration for mitigating catastrophic risks from advanced AL. Contrast this with SB 1047. This would heavily regulate above 10 to the 25, including full bans on open source, until a protocol is designed to allow this to happen safety, they say. No idea what that would be, with no adjustments over time. SB 1047 starts at 10 to the 26, requires only reasonable assurance, and has a $100 million minimum, such that the threshold will rapidly scale higher very soon. Indeed, the ICFG says the threshold should over time be adjusted downwards, not upwards, due to algorithmic and hardware improvements. This also proposes a ban on long-term planning agents, which unfortunately is not how any of this works. I don't know how to allow short-term planning agents and effectively stop people from making long-term ones. What would that mean in practice? There was this talk that included Yoshua Bengio, Max Tegmark, and John Tallinn. What about the full international scientific report on the safety of advanced AI? I looked briefly and I was disappointed. Over 95% of this report is the standard concerns about job displacements and deep fakes and privacy and other similar issues. The one section that does address loss of control says experts disagree about whether this could be a concern in the future if we create things smarter than ourselves, so who can say? They even say that a loss of control of highly capable AI systems is not necessarily catastrophic. That is the only time the word catastrophic is used and they do not say existential. Extinction is only mentioned once in the section directly after that, entitled, AI researchers have differing views on loss of control risks. Thus, despite the conference saying it should focus on existential dangers, this report is in effect highly dismissive of them, including implicitly treating the uncertainty as reason not throw up one's hands and focus on issues like implicit bias. 38 Ways to Steal Your Model Weights Top AI labs are currently dramatically insecure. As the value of their model weights and other assets rises, both commercially and as an existential risk and matter of national security, this will increasingly become a problem. Alexander Wang, CEO of Scale AI, did a China Talk interview in which he emphasized the need to lock down the labs if AI capabilities continue to advance. Rand recently came out with an extensive report on how to secure model weights. As they note, securing only the model weights is a far more tractable problem than securing all the data and algorithms involved. They assume future frontier models will be larger, and online API access will need to be widespread. Here is a Q&A with Director Sela Nevo one of the coat whores, which goes over the most basic items. Key contributions of this report. We identify approximately 38 meaningfully distinct attack vectors. In most cases, an organization's vulnerability to just one of these vectors can compromise its security. 
we provide hundreds of real-world examples in which these attack vectors were deployed successfully, demonstrating that they are feasible and providing context on what such attacks look like in practice. We explore a variety of potential attacker capabilities, from opportunistic, often financially driven criminals, to highly resourced nation-state operations. This categorization of attacker capabilities allows organizations to identify sequential priorities depending on their current security infrastructure. We estimate the feasibility of each attack vector being executed by different categories of attackers. About a dozen attack vectors are likely infeasible for non-state actors, but they are feasible for state actors, highlighting the need for significantly more capable security systems to defend against state actors. Expert opinions vary significantly on the capabilities of state actors and how to defend against them. We propose and define five security levels and recommend preliminary benchmark security systems that roughly achieve the security levels. Each level is defined as being secure against attack vectors, feasible for increasingly capable categories of malicious actors. The benchmarks can help to calibrate the trade-off between security investment and protection against different actors. The security levels are not meant to be used as a standard. Rather, they provide concrete suggestions for steps that frontier AI organizations can take at different stages of their continuous security enhancement strategy. What are their core recommendations? They start with things that need to be done yesterday. The biggest dangers lie in the future, but our security now is woefully inadequate to the dangers that exist now. Avoiding significant security gaps is highly challenging and requires comprehensive implementation of a broad set of security practices. However, we highlight several recommendations that should be urgent priorities for frontier AI organizations today. These recommendations are critical to model weight security, most are feasible to achieve within about a year given prioritization, and they are not yet comprehensively implemented in frontier AI organizations. Develop a security plan for a comprehensive threat model focused on preventing unauthorized access and theft of the model's weights. Centralize all copies of weights to a limited number of access-controlled and monitored systems. Reduce the number of people authorized to access the weights. Harden interfaces for model access against weight exfiltration. Implement insider threat programs. Invest in defense in depth, multiple layers of security controls that provide redundancy in case some controls fail. Engage advanced third-party red teaming that reasonably simulates relevant threat actors. Incorporate confidential computing to secure the weights during use and reduce the attack surface. This measure is more challenging to implement than the others in this list, but is backed by a strong consensus in industry. This is the least you could do if you cared about the security of model weights. Have an actual plan, limit access and attack surface, use red teaming and defense in depth. As Leopold noted, our goal must be to stay ahead of the threat curve. Operational capacity definitions. OC1 amateur attempts. Operations roughly less capable than or comparable to a single individual with some limited professional expertise in information security spending several days with a total budget of up to $1,000 on the specific operation and no pre-existing infrastructure or access to the organization. This includes the operations of many hobbyist hackers, as well as more experienced hackers who implement completely untargeted spray and prey attacks. OC2 Professional Opportunistic Efforts Operations roughly less capable than or comparable to a single individual who is broadly capable in information security, spending several weeks with a total budget of up to $10,000 on the specific operation with pre-existing personal cyber infrastructure but no pre-existing access to the organization. This includes the operations of many individual professional hackers as well as capable hacker groups when executing untargeted or lower priority attacks. OC3 Cybercrime Syndicates and Insider Threats Operations roughly less capable than or comparable to 10 individuals who are experienced professionals in information security spending several months 
with a total budget of up to $1 million on the specific operation, with major pre-existing cyber-attack infrastructure but no pre-existing access to the organization. Also included in this category are attempts by insider threats within the organization, who will have significantly less resources and expertise than the previous operations described as part of this category, but significant access to sensitive organization resources, e.g. a senior member of the organization's research team. This includes the operations of many world-renowned criminal hacker groups, well-resourced terrorist organizations, disgruntled employees, and industrial espionage organizations, a OC4 standard operations by leading cyber-capable institutions. Operations roughly less capable than or comparable to 100 individuals who have experience in a variety of relevant professions, cybersecurity, human intelligence gathering, physical operations, etc., spending a year with a total budget of up to $10 million on the specific operation, with vast infrastructure and access to state resources such as legal cover, interception of communication infrastructure, and more. This includes the operations of many of the world's leading state-sponsored groups and many foreign intelligence agencies across the world. The top cyber-capable nations globally can execute such operations more than 100 times per year. OC5 top priority operations by the top cyber-capable institutions. Operations roughly less capable than or comparable to 1,000 individuals who have experience and expertise years ahead of the public state-of-the-art in a variety of relevant professions, cybersecurity, human intelligence gathering, physical operations, etc., spending years with a total budget of up to $1 billion on the specific operation with state-level infrastructure and access developed over decades and access to state resources such as legal cover, interception of communication infrastructure, and more. This includes the handful of operations most prioritized by the world's most capable nation-states. A the set of actors within OC3 is more diverse than in other categories, most notably in the inclusion of both insider threats and external cyber organizations. We group the OC3 actors together because the level of investment required to robustly defend against them is comparable, despite the specific measures required being partially but not fully overlapping. The authors note that FBI Director Christopher Wray implied China had a workforce of more than 175,000 hackers. If China wanted to go full OC5+, they could. For now, it would not make sense given the economic and diplomatic costs. Later, it will. They also say North Korea invests between 10% and 20% of the regime's military budget in cyber warfare, between $400 million and $800 million. I presume they do this largely because it is profitable for them. Everyone acknowledges that an OC5 level attack on any major lab would almost certainly succeed. For now, that is fine. The question is, when does that become not fine? And where should we be right now? Should we be able to block an OC4 attack? I certainly hope we would be able to block an OC3 one given the value at stake. We do not need to attempt bulletproof security until we are under robust attack and have assets that justify the real costs of attempting bulletproof security. We do need to be trying it all and starting our preparations and groundwork now. Longer term, we will need things like this to have much chance similar to what one would do if worried about model self-exfiltration, which we should be worried about in such scenarios as well. Physical bandwidth limitations between devices or networks containing weights and the outside world. Development of hardware to secure model weights while providing an interface for inference, analogous to hardware security modules in the cryptographic domain. Setting up secure, completely isolated networks for training, research, and other more advanced interactions with weights. They highlight 38 potential attack vectors in nine categories. Summary of attack vectors. Running unauthorized code. Exploiting vulnerabilities for which a patch exists. Attacking non-updated software. Exploiting reported but not fully patched vulnerabilities. Finding and exploiting individual zero days. 
direct access to zero days at scale, compromising existing credentials, social engineering, password brute forcing and cracking, exploitation of exposed credentials, expanding illegitimate access, e.g. escalating privileges, undermining the access control system, itself, encryption, authentication vulnerabilities in the access control system, intentional backdoors in algorithms, protocols or products in the access control system, code vulnerabilities in the access control system, access to secret material undermining a protocol. Bypassing primary security system. Altogether, incorrect configuration or security policy implementation, additional, less secure copies of sensitive data, alternative, less secure authentication or access schemes. AI-specific attack vectors. Discovering existing vulnerabilities in the ML stack, intentional ML supply chain compromise, prompt triggered code execution, model extraction, model distillation. Non-trivial access to data or networks, digital access to air-gapped networks, side-channel attacks, including through leaked emanations, i.e. tempest attacks, eavesdropping and wiretaps. Unauthorized physical access to systems, direct physical access to sensitive systems, malicious placement of portable devices, physical access to devices in other locations, evasion of physical access control systems, Penetration of physical hardware security, armed break-in, military takeover. Supply chain attacks, services and equipment the organization uses, code and infrastructure incorporated into the code base, vendors with access to information. Human intelligence, bribes and cooperation, extortion, candidate placement, organizational leverage attacks, organizationally approved access. Note. Zero days are vulnerabilities that have not yet been identified or mitigated by the vendor or the broad cybersecurity community, i.e., there have been at most zero days since the vendor discovered or mitigated the vulnerability. How many resources are needed to launch various attacks? They have a table for that. The numbers here are weird, representing chance of success linearly from 20% to 80% against an arbitrary target. I would think things would scale differently. I also do not think that up to 20% chance of success is the right category. If something has a 10% chance of success, it is a big deal. Tables in original post. Also important is that this is an enumeration of things we know about. That is a lower bound on the risk. The actual situation is far worse because it includes unknown unknowns. It is very hard for the things we do not know about to be good news here. For multiple reasons, it is prudent to recognize the plausibility of current assessments underestimating the threat. We assume that other attack vectors exist that are as yet unknown to security experts, particularly ones concerning advanced persistent threats, APTs, such as state actors. Novel attack vectors and conceptual approaches are likely to evolve over time, as are novel insights and infrastructure that make existing attacks more accessible. Publicly known examples of attacks are only a subset of attacks actually taking place, especially when it comes to more advanced operations. Most APTs persist for years before discovery. Many national security experts with whom we spoke mentioned that the vast majority of highly resourced state actor attacks they are aware of were never publicly revealed. This means that a purely empirical analysis based on detected operations would systematically underestimate the feasibility and frequency of advanced attack vectors. Accordingly, one should expect capable actors to have access not only to well-established attack vectors, but also to unknown approaches. In Appendix A, we share many examples of state actors developing such conceptually novel attacks years or decades before they were discovered by others. All of that involves human attack vectors only. If we include future AI attack vectors enabled by future frontier models, the situation gets even more dire if we do not bring our new capabilities to play on defense with similar effectiveness. Chapter 6 proposes that labs define security levels. SLs, from SL1 to SL5. If you are SLX, 
you are protected against threats of OC Level X. So what does it take to get to even SL1? Overview of the security level one. Benchmark. Weight security. Weight storage. Sensitive data remain internal. Weight encryption. Best effort. Physical security. Data centers of cloud providers. Access control. Access control for sensitive assets. Access log or audit trail. Security of network and other non-weight sensitive assets. Software. Moderately frequent software update management and compliance monitoring. Access, permissions and credentials. Least privilege principle. Restrictions on device and account sharing. Password best practices. Multi-factor authentication. Single sign-on, SSO. Backup and recovery tools. Commercial identity and access management. IAM tools. Zero trust architecture. Adherence to at least the standards in the traditional level of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agencies, CISA's Zero Trust Maturity Model. Hardware. Modern device architectures that establish root of trust and block malicious code execution, CPU anti-exploitation features. Supply chain. The reputability of software is reviewed before incorporation. Security tooling. Modern authentication infrastructure. Commercial network security solutions, commercial endpoint security solutions, reliance on standard security infrastructure, depending on circumstances. Configuration management, enforce screen locks for inactivity. Personnel. Security, awareness and training. Basic onboarding information security training for employees. Security assurance and testing. Risk and security assessments. Internal reviews. Security team capacity, basic incident response capabilities, maintenance, information security news monitoring and implementation. Note, a CISA, Zero Trust Maturity Model, version 2.0, April 2023a. In some senses, this is easy. In others, in the context of a startup, it is asking a lot. Moving to SL2 means industry best practices across the board. Doing all of the standard things everyone says one should do is a standard few companies, in practice, actually meet. Almost everyone is doing some number of stupid things in the form of not doing some of the things on this list. Overview of the Security Level 2 Benchmark Implementation of previous security levels The organization has implemented all controls from SL1 Weight security, weight storage, storage location e.g. weights are stored exclusively on servers and not on local devices. Encryption, e.g. all keys are secured in a key management system. Security during transport and use. Encryption in transit, i.e. not transporting weights over public or unencrypted channels. Physical security. Data centers are guarded and only people with authorization are allowed inside. Visitor access is restricted and logged. Access control. Restrictions on sensitive interactions, e.g. require multi-factor authentication using FIDO authentication hardware security keys. Monitoring. Logging of all sensitive interactions, regulation and monitoring of weight copies across the organization network. AI model resilience. Model robustness. Input reconstruction, e.g. during inference. A privately known prefix is added ahead of the user prompt. Adversarial training. Security of network and other non-weight. Sensitive assets. Software. Frequent software update management and compliance monitoring. Access, permissions and credentials. Strong password enforcement. The work network is separate from the guest network. Guest accounts disabled whenever possible. Strong access management tools. Zero trust architecture. The organization adheres to at least the standards in the initial level of CISA's zero trust maturity model. Hardware. Lost or stolen devices reported. All network devices are visible and trackable. Supply chain. Review of vendor and supplier security. Security. Tooling. Disk encryption. Network communications are encrypted by default. Email security tools. Use of integrated security approaches. Configuration management. 
incorporate fundamental infrastructure and policies for security by design and security by default, configuration management monitoring, physical security, office security, careful disposal of printed materials, personnel, security, awareness and training, periodic mandatory information, security training for all employees, employee training on configuration errors and their security implications, filtering and monitoring, installation of monitoring software for secure network access, active drills to identify and educate non-compliant employees, security assurance and testing, red teaming and penetration testing, mandatory external reviews, community involvement and reporting, bug bounty and vulnerability discovery programs, software development process, secure software development standards, compliance with NIST's secure software development framework, incident response, protocols and funding for rapid incident response, incident reporting, security team capacity, constant availability of qualified personnel, maintenance, continuous vulnerability management and adaptation to information security developments, other organization policies, promotion of a security mindset by organization management, stringent remote work policies. Note, CISA's Zero Trust Maturity Model, CISA 2023. Note, FIDO, Fast Identity Online. What about SL3? It is essentially more of the same, only more so, and with serious worries about insider threat vectors. Any individual item on the list seems plausible but annoying. Doing all of them, in a world where your weakest point gets attacked, is not going to happen without a concerted effort. Overview of the Security Level 3 Benchmark Implementation of Previous Security Levels the organization has implemented all controls from SL1 and SL2. Weight security, weight storage, centralized and restricted management of weight storage, secure cloud network, if applicable, dedicated devices for weights and weight security data. Physical security. Data centers are guarded or locked at all times. Premises are swept for intruders frequently. Premises are meticulously swept for unauthorized devices routinely. Permitted interfaces. Authorized users who interact with the weights do so only through a software interface that reduces risk of the weights being illegitimately copied. Any code accessing the weights minimizes attack surface, provides only simple forms of access, and uses the minimal amount of highly trusted and well-established external code necessary, avoiding model interactions that bypass monitoring or constraints. Access control protocols and policies for sensitive interactions, e.g. access to the various permitted interfaces to the weights, is stringently controlled, multi-party authorization, security reviews, etc. Monitoring. Ongoing manual monitoring of sensitive interactions, ongoing automated anomaly detection, automated and manual monitoring, blocking of potentially malicious queries, frequent compromise assessment, Frequent integrity checks via comparison against a baseline system configuration, gold image. Standard compliance. Implementation of measures described by NIST SP 800-171 or equivalent. Future implementation of measures described by CMMC 2.0 Level 3. AI model resilience. Model robustness. Adversarial input detection. Oracle protection. Limitations on the number of inferences using the same credentials security of network and other non-weight sensitive assets, software, very frequent software update management and compliance monitoring, access, permissions and credentials, 802.1x authentication, zero trust architecture, the organization adheres to at least the standards in the advanced level of CESA's zero trust maturity model, hardware, security minded hardware sourcing, supply chain, Software Inventory Management Supply Chain Security is commensurate with the organization's security. Security Tooling Enforcement of security policies through code rather than manual compliance. Security Policy Enforcement for Network Access across Devices Personnel Security Awareness and Training 
Employee Awareness of Weight Interaction, Monitoring, Security Training for Employees, not necessarily only those with access, Security Risk Reporting Program, Filtering and Monitoring, Insider Threat Program, Security Assurance and Testing, Red Teaming and Penetration, Testing, Ongoing Penetration Testing, Penetration Testing of Physical Access and Facility Security, Advanced Red Teaming, Elite External Team, Substantial funding, access to design and code, testing insider threats, expanded access, attention to the weights and authentication, risk and security assessments, keeping a risk register, threat detection and response, placement of effective honeypots, security team capacity, general increased capacity, compared with SL2, concrete experience with APTs, leveraging diverse security experience from leading organizations. Other organization policies, two independent security layers. Note, a Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification CMMC 2.0 Level 3 expert. Requirements are defined by Chief Information Officer, U.S. Department of Defense, CMMC Model, webpage, undated. B. CISA, 2023A. SL4 gets expensive. Things are going to get slowed down. You do not want to be implementing this level of paranoia too early. Overview of the security level 4. Benchmark. Implementation of previous security levels. The organization has implemented all controls from SL1, SL3. Weight security. Weight storage. Isolation of weight storage. Weight storage setup is protected against eavesdropping and the simplest of tempest attacks, hardware-enforced limits on output rate, reduced communication capabilities, security during transport and use, confidential computing, when available. Physical security. Increased guarding. Compared with SL3, via manned and digital systems, meticulous logging of all access, prohibiting devices near the setup. Permitted interfaces, specialized hardware for all external interfaces. Monitoring, enforcement of time buffered review, software limitation, protection of the monitoring logs at the hardware level, comprehensive anomaly detection and alert system over the monitoring logs. AI model resilience, model robustness, adversarial output detection, oracle protection, output reconstruction, security of network and other non-weight, sensitive assets, software, limiting the attack surface, e.g. the limited interaction interfaces of a Chromebook, access, permissions and credentials, enforcement of strong random passwords and keys for enhanced security, zero trust architecture, adherence to at least the standards in the optimal level of CISA's zero trust maturity model, hardware, all hardware used on devices must undergo source code auditing and be validated as secure, secure hardware required for access, ongoing compromise assessment on all devices with access. Supply chain. Strict application allow listing, especially for sandboxes. SLSA Level 3 specification for all software used. Security tooling. Significant investment in advanced security systems. Physical security. Banning of unauthorized devices. Personnel security. Filtering and monitoring. Preventing third-party access and reporting suspected illegitimate incidents. Advanced insider threat program. Occasional employee integrity testing. Security assurance and testing. Red teaming and penetration. Testing. Ongoing research and red teaming to identify potential attack methods on the weight interface. Sees. Ensuring physical security through red teaming. Experience dealing with intelligence agencies. Risk and security assessments. Automated weight exfiltration attempts. Manual weight exfiltration attempts. Compliance with the FedRAMP. High standards for security. Security team capacity. General increased capacity. Compared with SL3. Greater concrete experience with APTs. Compared with SL3. Zero-day vulnerability discovery capabilities. The security team is empowered to not compromise security over other stakeholders. Other organization policies. Designating sensitive details of the weight security system. Vetting of investors and other positions of influence. Prioritizing leak prevention over other organizational goals. 
Four independent security layers. Note, a sizer, 2023A. BC FedRAMP, understanding baselines and impact levels in FedRAMP. Blog post, November 16th, 2017. Cell 5 is that much more expensive to implement. You have to care quite a lot. Having eight security layers is quite the ask, as are many other action items. Overview of the security level 5. Benchmark. Implementation of previous security levels. The organization has implemented all controls from SL1, SL4. Weight security. Weight storage. Extreme isolation of weight storage. Completely isolated network. Advanced preventive measures for side channel attacks, e.g. noise injection, time delays and other tools. Formal hardware verification of key components. Physical security. Increased significant guarding, compared with SL4. Supervised access for everyone. Routine rigorous device inspections. Disabling of most communication at the hardware level. Permitted interfaces. Strict limitation of external connections to the completely isolated network. Access control. Irrecoverable key policy. Barring alternative access or key retrieval systems. Standard compliance. Protection equivalent to that required for top secret, TS, Secure Compartmented Information, SCI. AI model resilience, Oracle protection, constant inference time. Security of network and other, non-weight, sensitive assets, supply chain, strong limitations on software providers, e.g. only developed internally or by an extremely reliable source. Strong limitations on hardware providers, e.g only developed internally or by an extremely reliable source. Personnel security, personal protection, proactive protection of executives and individuals handling sensitive materials. Security assurance and testing, red teaming and penetration testing, proactive search for crucial vulnerabilities, e.g. zero days. Maintenance, security is strongly prioritized over availability, e.g. Barring connecting external devices to completely isolated network to debug a critical production issue. Other organization policies. Eight independent security layers. Is all that necessary? Would it even be sufficient? Consensus weakens as you move up to higher security levels. There are deeper and more conceptual disagreements about what is needed to achieve the security implied by SL4 and SL5, with opinions ranging from the SL3 benchmark being sufficient to secure against all threat actors to claims that no system could ever present a significant hurdle to operations in the OC5 category. A particular point of disagreement was the number of people who should have authorization to access the weights. Some experts strongly asserted that the model weights cannot be secure if this number is not aggressively reduced, e.g. to the low tens. Others claimed that such a reduction would not be necessary, feasible, or justified. I have definitely talked to an expert who thought that against an OC5 operation, all you can hope to do is buy some time. You can prevent them from stealing everything the first day they set their sights on it, but protecting assets over time is, they claimed, rather hopeless. I haven't seen credible claims that SL3-style procedures would be sufficient to protect against OC5, and I find that highly implausible, even if it has rarely, if ever, been tried. The low tens seems to me quite a lot of people to have access to your core asset. I'm not sure how different low tens is from infinity. Certainly if your plan involves dozens of people each not being compromised, then you have no plan. The second half of the report is details of the different attack vectors, the quest for sane regulations. House Appropriations Bill cuts $100 million in funding for NIST. This is one of the worst things to be cutting right now. It is already woefully underfunded. New paper on risk thresholds for frontier AI. How should we combine compute thresholds, risk thresholds, and capability thresholds? The conclusion is to primarily use capability thresholds, but have them be informed by risk thresholds. I'm going to quote this in full because it feels like a good steelman of being skeptical about going too far too fast on regulation. Seb Creer, Google DeepMind. I tend to think of AI policy in three consecutive phases, observation, 
and monitoring, standardization and norm setting, and then rules, law, and regulations if necessary. My impression is that in recent years, some governance crowds have taken the reverse approach, motivated by the usual policymaker urgency of, we must do something now. The problem with this is that you now have to define and cement very precise things that are still evolving, like evaluations and mitigations. Combined with the many trade-offs, inefficiencies, conflicting interests, low capacity, and frankly generally poor decision-making that governments currently suffer from, this often leads to messes, evidentiary gaps, legal risks, and rushed policymaking. To be clear, I definitely think AI is a technology that will warrant some degree of regulation, and there may well be sector-specific uses or applications that warrant this now. I think cybersecurity-oriented regulations make more sense than omnibus regulatory behemoths. But at a more general level, I feel like we're still in a phase where the value comes from research and finding things out. And I'd rather see 50 organizations developing evaluations and five advocating for regulations rather than the reverse, i.e., what we have today. This is also why I'm quite supportive of the experimental nature of institutions like the AI Safety Institute, where both sides iteratively learn as things progress. Some people justify hasty policymaking because they think we will have AGI very soon, and therefore this demands quick preemptive action. Otherwise, governments won't have time to intervene. I think it's right to try to preempt things, prepare institutions, and think ahead. But I don't think timelines alone grant a carte blanche for any kind of legislation. Plus, if we are indeed getting very close to AGI, I have zero doubt that governments will inevitably wake up, and the implications, particularly for large risks, will be a lot more Leopold-like than creating a new GDPR for AI. So essentially one, for now we should observe and monitor, lay groundwork such as with NIST, and perhaps do select sector-specific interventions such as in cybersecurity. Two, later we will do, and will want to do various regulatory actions. Three, but let's try and push the key decisions forward in time so we learn more. Also, GPDR is deeply stupid law. Do not make laws like GPDR. They do great harm via creating frictions without accomplishing almost anything. It is also correct to worry about regulatory lock-in. Not infinitely worried, as in, anything imposed is automatically forever. But yes, there is a lot of inertia, and these things are hard to reverse. How much do we need to worry about moving too slowly? That depends on, one, how long you think we have. Two, how quickly you think we can move. Three, how sensibly you think we would move in a crisis, but with more information. Four, whether you think that by the time there is a crisis, it will be too late. Reasonable people disagree on all those questions. What most critics and skeptics fail to do is differentiate their responses to different types of regulatory proposals, as in, is a proposal about observing and monitoring and allowing us to intervene when the time comes? Or is it attempting to intervene now on what people can do now or dictate the form of intervention later? Consider the response to something like SB 1047 or Biden's executive order. Both are primarily about transparency, observation, and monitoring of frontier models for the sole purpose of concerns on catastrophic or existential risks. They are deeply compatible with the perspective outlined here by Creer. The logical response is suggesting improvements and discussing details and talking price. Instead, most, not Creer, who are skeptical of other forms of regulation, choose for SB 1047 instead to hallucinate a different bill and different impacts and for the executive order to demand it be repealed. They hallucinated so badly on SB 1047 that they demanded the removal of the limited duty exception, a free option that exclusively lightened the burden of the bill and got their wish. The logic of these others seems to be, one, you want to be able to observe and monitor and prepare to act. Two, if you did that, you might later act. Three, can't have that. So we can't let you observe or monitor. SB 1047. SB 1047 has strong bipartisan public support. 77%, 13%, if this is how you ask about it. I notice that this is not exactly a neutral wording, although its claims are accurate. 
the proposal would require California companies developing the next generation of most powerful AI systems to test for safety risks before releasing them. If testing shows that the AI system could be used to cause catastrophic harm to society, such as disrupting the financial system, shutting down the power grid or creating biological weapons, the company must add reasonable safeguards to prevent these risks. If the company fails to test or adopt reasonable safeguards, they could be held accountable by the Attorney General of California. Do you support or oppose this proposal? If support, oppose. Is that strongly, support, oppose, or just somewhat? Support strongly, 55%. Support somewhat, 23%. Oppose somewhat, 5%. Oppose strongly, 9%. Don't know, 9%. Total sample size, 800. Margin of error, plus or minus 3.5%. This is unsurprising, although the margin is impressive. We have yet to see a poll on AI that doesn't go this way. The LA Times discusses SB 1047 and other proposed bills here. All the other bills seem actively counterproductive to me, especially the pure rent-seeking demand from Teamsters for supervision of self-driving trucks. Dean Ball argues that SB 1047 is bad because it creates a government regulatory agency via a fully general public choice counterargument against having government regulatory agencies for anything with broad positive use cases. I ended up discussing various SB 1047 things on Twitter a bit with him and Eli Dorado. Politico covers that Y Combinator sent a letter opposing SB 1047. While the letter refreshingly say that the law was clearly drafted in good faith, all four of the letter listed concerns misstate the practical implications of the bill in alarmist terms. Then they say, rather than proposing fixes to particular issues, why not scrap the whole thing and instead encourage open source software? It is telling that such letters so often ask not only for no rules of any kind, but also for active government handouts and special treatment despite SB 1047 already giving open source special treatment, the weak in audio. Dwarkesh Patel interviews Tony Blair with AI as a major focus. Blair sees AI as the biggest change since the Industrial Revolution, the most important thing to focus on. He very much gives off the technocrat, this is how it all works vibe without pretending that the technocrats are generally in charge or governments are competent. He sees AI will be huge, but doesn't seem to notice the existential risk angle. Essentially, he is a sensible AI skeptic who does not expect AGI or a takeoff, but sees AI would be transformative anyway. His focus has been good governance, so then he pulls out the standard good governance tropes. He also emphasizes that policy and politics or change makers, are distinct things. And if you want to accomplish anything, you have to be policy first. Also has this great line from Blair. The problem with government is not that it's a conspiracy, either left wing or right wing. It's a conspiracy for inertia. Interview with OpenAI board chairman Brett Taylor. He is excited for this generation of AI. His focus is clearly being CEO of Sierra, where he is building hopefully cool solutions for consumer brands, rather than his far more important role at OpenAI. That does at least mean he has lots of practical experience with current models. He holds his own on mundane job transitions, but does not seem to be feeling the AGI. Instead, he says, beware specific hype, but the economy will transform within 30 years, and this will meet the hype. Someone needs to have him talk to the technical staff. For now, it seems he does not grok existential risk because he doesn't grok AGI. Lester Holt interviews OpenAI CEO Sam Altman and Airbnb's Brian Chesky, skip to about 35 or eight. It is 40 minutes. Often not new information dense, Colin Fraser notes some of the ways Altman is playing rhetorical sleight of hand with the risks of AGI. If you expect to be able to tell an AI, go solve all of physics or go create a great company, then that is a completely transformed world. You cannot simply talk about solving misuse as if misuse was a distinct magisteria. When discussing events around Altman's firing, 
Altman sticks to his story and lets Chesky tell a series of rather glaring whoppers. Both try to walk back the idea of an AGI moment, there are only various capabilities in various areas, and try to deny that there is a race in a meaningful sense. Altman follows the general theme of acting like everything will stay normal under AGI. I know he knows better. When he says AGI could double the world's GDP, Holt points out this sounds outlandish. But I see it as outlandish on the downside, and I think Altman knows that. And he is making the we have great ability to steer our current models and their values card. The real problem is choosing our values, which I see as a highly disingenuous attempt to dismiss alignment problems as being handled. Mira Muradi talks to Dartmouth Engineering, where she is an alumni. It has some key spots, but has low information density. One, she says we should expect to get PhD-level intelligence for specific tasks in a year to 18 months. The usual suspects responded to this as saying no GPT-5 for over a year and did some gloating, which seems like the wrong response to this kind of prediction. Two, she was broadly supportive of the government understanding what is going on and called for more of that. Three, she says of the AI, it's a tool, right? And there is a subtle black pill that she does not seem to notice that this might not be the full story in the future. Four, it does seem, she said, some creative jobs maybe will go away due to AI, but maybe they shouldn't have been there in the first place. Hot take. She then tried to save it on Twitter. Rune, linking to this clip from this segment, I fucking love Larry Summers. Beth Jezos, responding to clip. So, Aring based holy Bajon. Larry Summers introduces Bloomberg to the concept of recursive self improvement, eventually using the term explicitly and predicting transformative and seismic change. The issue, he says, is how do you manage that? He says we cannot leave AI only to AI developers. Public authorities must take a strong role in ensuring it gets used for good, but stopping it or slowing it down without thinking about positive developments would seed the field to the irresponsible and our adversaries, and he endorses responsible iterative deployment. If this counts as highly based, where public authorities must take a strong role, and we should consider the positive benefits and also the downsides, perhaps we are getting somewhere. Lots of great stuff here. We need to now also work in alignment and the control problem, which did not get mentioned. New interview with Anthropic CEO Dario Amodi. I haven't listened yet. Yuhal Noah Harai asks, among other things, what happens when finance becomes when zero humans understand the financial system? Would we end up controlled by an essentially alien intelligence? This specific mechanism is not that high on my list. The generalized version is reasonably high. Yes, of course, we will be under immense pressure to turn control over all of the things to AIs. Rhetorical innovation. Leo Gao of OpenAI reminds us we do not know how neutral networks work. He does so in response to someone citing Leo Gao's paper as evidence to the contrary that someone must have missed. When the moment was described, he did not take it great. This does seem to be accurate. Augustine Lebron, no one, absolutely no one. Every AI researcher, AGI is incredibly dangerous and no one should build it, except me. I can do it safely. Eliezer Yudkowsky. Elon starts OpenAI because he doesn't like Demis. OpenAI people repeatedly distrust OpenAI and leave to start their own companies, none of which trust each other. And one observes that they're all founded by the sort of people who went to work for OpenAI in the first place. Elon Musk. Actually, I like Demis. Just don't trust the Google corporate blob. Eliezer Yudkowsky. Apparently, I've heard and told the wrong story all these years. Reluctantly because I do usually prefer to listen to people when they tell me what they actually said or thought. What with my not being a telepath, I feel obligated to mention that three different sources reached out to me to say, no, Elon actually did dislike Demise. This puts me in an odd position, and I'm not sure what I'll say going forward. I am really reluctant to contradict people about what they themselves thought, but I also don't want to represent a mixed state of evidence to the public as if it was a pure state of evidence. An attempt to portray AGI existential risk as risk of domination. Would such a focus on such details convince people who are not otherwise convinced? 
My guess is some people do respond to such details. It makes things click, but it is hard to predict which people will respond well to which details. People are worried about AI killing everyone. I'm not going to lie and say it's good. That doesn't mean give up. Alex Trembath. When I tell people I work in environmental policy, the most common response, by far, is to ask me how fucked are we? Kelsey Piper. People say this to me about climate and about AI. Guys, there are lots of serious challenges ahead, but we are an inventive, wealthy, ambitious society with lots of brilliant, hardworking people, and all of our problems are solvable. We're not doomed. We just have a big to-do list. One reason I sincerely love Silicon Valley despite its deficits is that it's the only place where I've run into strangers who will listen to a description of a serious problem they haven't heard of before and go, huh, beat. What needs doing? Everyone who thinks you should obviously do insane thing is wrong. That is the easy realization. The hard part is, what is the sane thing? Francois Fleuré. AGI happens in three wise. Where should I invest my money? Eliezer Yukowski. Everyone in the replies is saying guns and bullets, and I regret to inform everyone that will not actually work. There were a ton of replies to Fleuré. They did not contain original ideas. The most common were things like Energy, Microsoft, and NVIDIA, which are a way to go out while having previously had more dollars to your name. Other people are not as worried about AI killing everyone. As many have long suspected about many accelerationists, the positions of Beth Jezos make a lot more sense if he simply does not believe in AGI. Beth Jezos. ASI is a fairy tale. Explain to me, what the fuck is ASI? Formally. Seriously, I'll wait. Mario Canistra explains a lot. Of course I'd want to accelerate if I didn't think super-intelligent AI was even possible. We can safety consider the matter closed then, the lighter side. We now know why he named his new company XAI. Elon Musk. The trend is very strong that any AI company's name that can be inverted will be inverted.